Welcome. Sorry to, to shut the conversations down, but we'll have plenty of time to all talk together. So I'm glad to see you starting and getting a head start on us. My name is January Parcos Arnal, and I am the interim senior curator here for performance and public practice at the MCA. And you're in the commons. And this is the space for uh, artistic and, and civic exchange at the museum. We love to do talks like this here just because it's a nice, comfy space. Um, and we really want you to feel encouraged to be a part of this discussion. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this open dialogue format. And I'm going to introduce this dialogue series, as well as our incredible speakers, Frank Juan and Britt Julius. So very pleased to have you both here. But I'll give you more on both of them as well. So the dialogue series is the museum's ongoing commitment to discussions around equity and inclusion in museum practice and many other things. This is our big talk series that we do every year. Um, last year and this year, we've made it a series rather than a single event. So you'll see four events as part of our dialogue series this year. And the topic is really on inheritance and what that means in the public sphere. So when we think about inheritance, we're thinking about, you know, what gets passed down generation to generation. It's often about a financial inheritance, but inheritance works on so many different levels. Tonight we're talking about historical trauma and the inheritance that comes along with that. We're going to be talking about the environment and what we're leaving for the next generation um, and generational inequality in that way. And we're going to be talking about migration stories and how migration stories change through generations and how we learn and uh, affect our practice and our lives through those stories um, that we inherit. So those are some of the things that we'll be doing uh, over the course of the next three months. Um, in, yes, in March, next month, we'll have a dialogue forum called Not Your Parents Migration Story. And that'll be with Kieran Deal, Jordan Nassar, and Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle. And then uh, in April, we'll have an open dialogue on generational inequality and in the environment with Pope L and Jenny Kendler, another artist here in Chicago. Um, and then we'll culminate, and this was just announced yesterday, with a dialogue keynote with Kirby Jean Raymond, who's the designer of Pierre Moss. So very excited to have him kind of culminate this series and discuss how we move forward. But tonight, we have Britt Julius and Frank Juan with us for an open dialogue conversation on historical trauma. Um, and this open dialogue format means that you're a part of the program. So knowing that you, you came here, this other microphone that I'm holding is for you all. So please feel free to enter into the discussion at any point, not just to ask questions, but to share your knowledge as well. This is the benefit of us all coming together, and this is why I thank you so much for being here tonight, because I really think that you all have so much to say as well. We've invited Frank and, and Britt to share their knowledge as experts, um, and we definitely want you to be a part of it too. So I will nudge you throughout the evening, but just raise your hand if you want to speak. Again, it doesn't have to be a question. If you would like to speak, to share something or to ask a question, raise your hand and I will come around to you. And I'm going to ask you both to let me know if you see a hand that I don't see as well. <laughs> um, so Frank Juan is an award-winning Lakota hip-hop artist and music producer from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. Uh, he's a recipient of the Gates Millennium Scholarship. Juan attended Columbia College Chicago and he received a BA in audio arts and acoustics. Juan's awards include three Native American Music Awards, the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development, 2014 Native American 40 Under 40, the 2014 Chicago Mayor's Award for Civic en Engagement, and the 2016 Three Arts Grant for Chicago Artists. He's been featured in BuzzFeed, The Fader, Playboy, Vibe, NPR, ESPN, all the acronyms really, um, MTV's Rebel Music, Native America. Juan has written for various publications, including Decolonization, Indigeneity, Education, and Society, and The Guardian. Frank Juan also travels the world, thank you for being here tonight, <laughs> telling his story through performance and doing workshops focused on self-empowerment and expressions of truth. Britt Julius, 
who is no stranger to the MCA and has been here for other programs before that you may have seen, um, is a writer of many forms, including essays and criticism, journalism, poetry, and storytelling. For the last five years, she's penned a weekly column on music and nightlife for the Chicago Tribune. She previously worked as an editor of Vice's Thump and a staff writer for MTV.com and WBEZ here in Chicago. Her work focuses on the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, arts, culture, and politics. And her original essays have appeared in the New York Times, GQ, Esquire, Elle, The Guardian, Vice, Pitchfork, and W Magazine, among others. As a reporter, she has written for publications including Vogue, Bon Appetit, Women's Health, Glamour, Rolling Stone, The Fader, and Complex. And most recently, she was recipient of the Studs Terkel Award for Journalism. Congratulations on that. Um, I also just want to say one other note before we move on to the actual discussion, which is these kinds of free programs that we host here and the dialogue series, they require some support. So I just want to mention those folks who have helped us be able to put these on. Uh, major support for the dialogue series is support is provided by Julie and Larry Bernstein, the Zell Family Foundation, Carol Prins and John Hart, the Jessica Fund, and generous support is also provided by Lois and Steve Eisen and the Eisen Family Foundation, along with Karen and King Harris. So thank you to those folks for making it possible that we gather together here. So I wanted, after all of that, <laughs> to start with a note of just definitions. And if you both can kind of share with us a little bit, I sort of talked about your bios, but if you can share a little bit about what this term means to you and how you've been working on it most recently. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. So this term historical trauma here, we're, we're here to talk about. Um, I'm gonna speak from a very personal perspective on that topic. And before I, I speak on it, I just want to give a little context because I feel like, you know, that term historical trauma um, is really just the tip of the iceberg. And there's so much that goes on that needs to be discussed to even get to that point of historical trauma. And I find for a lot of, you know, people who don't have these sorts of conversations or haven't been in these sorts of spaces, sometimes it can become a very vague, almost buzzword sort of thing, almost like decolonization, you know. But I think what you're going to see today is how this term is, is a very real reality for a lot of people. And I think for a lot of us in the room, whether we're aware of it or not. So I'm Sichangu Lakota. I'm indigenous, indigenous to this continent. My people come from the plains, um, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wyoming. Uh, I was born and raised on the Rosebud Reservation in South Central South Dakota. Um, and my reservation is one of the larger reservations in the, in the country. And I represent um, only one of several Lakota tribes. Uh, does anyone who maybe isn't native and, and, and doesn't know the answer off the top want to take a guess at how many native tribes they think there are in the United States? Yeah? 15? Okay, that, that's one, one guess. Can we get a couple more maybe right here? 640 something, all right, that's a pretty specific number. Um, uh, all right, so actually, um, that's pretty much both ends of the spectrum, you know. Uh, there actually are about 566 federally recognized tribes in the United States alone, and there's many more that the U.S. government won't recognize. And uh, all of this kind of ties into what we're going to be talking about, even this term federal recognition. You know, so I was born and raised on a reservation in South Dakota, and it was about the size of Rhode Island. It was about the size of a small state. And it sits in one of the poorest counties in the whole country. Um, Todd County is one of the top five poorest counties consistently. And, uh, you know, even our poverty ties into this term, historical trauma. And so I was born and raised on a reservation. And I got a scholarship, and I was able to come here to Chicago to study. And... Honestly, the things I'm going to be talking about, and even this term historical trauma, I wasn't made aware of until probably my early to mid-20s. I'm 30 years old now. So I was carrying a lot of this stuff we're going to be talking about, a lot of this heaviness, and wasn't even aware of it. And I think, you know, um, my case isn't too unique to a lot of indigenous people from my generation. Um, and I'm going to speak about why we didn't even know about ourselves. So for indigenous people, our historical trauma is rooted in uh, genocide. 
and settler colonialism. So I want to talk about that a little bit because those are the things that led us to this term of historical trauma. So um, indigenous people in the United States suffered a genocide under the US government, one of the largest genocides in the world. But it isn't spoken about or taught about um, in a lot of spaces in this country. 99.8% uh, of indigenous people in the United States were wiped out during this genocide. So let's think about that. Less than 1% of us survived. You know, there were hundreds of millions of indigenous people here, um, hundreds of tribes, um, entire civilizations, and uh, they were wiped out to establish the country that we all now live in, you know? So we're also all tied to this genocide, whether we're aware of it or not. And uh, this was done to take land. This was done to, to, to get the land. Settler colonialism is about resources, taking resources, taking the land. And so that genocide was also systemically engineered by the U.S. government. This wasn't just some wild ragtag cowboys out killing Indians. This was literal U.S. laws put in place to uh, exterminate us. And I will highlight some of that. Um, you know, uh, it, it ties into a much larger topic, but... The actual origin of the term red skin comes from a, 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 a state policy. So in, um, the, the main, the main, the main uh, evidence that indigenous people use is this newspaper clipping from the 1800s from Minnesota. And um, this happened in California, this happened in Minnesota, this happened in South Dakota, but state governments actually paid people to kill indigenous people. They, they paid for our bodies. And in the state of Minnesota, to prove that you killed an Indian, you would take their scalp. And scalping was not an indigenous practice. It was actually brought here by the French. And so um, in Minnesota, they would scalp us after they killed us, and then they got $50 per red skin. The scalps were called redskins. You know, so, so we're starting to lead into not only how this was systemically engineered, this genocide into state and government policy, but also into things that are playing out today. You know, we see that term every day and, and, and we see it discussed. So, you know, not only were, were state governments literally paying settlers to murder us, to try to exterminate us, to take the land. Um, once the U.S. government, it wasn't uh, economic, uh, it wasn't a good economic return for them to keep literally going to war with us and trying to kill us. So then they signed treaties with our nations. And those treaties gave the United States government the rights to all the land that we live on now. And there were over 500 treaties signed with each nation. These were nation-to-nation law-binding government treaties. Um, and the U.S. government broke every single treaty it made with every single indigenous nation. They promised us um, a, a lot of things, and they... Uh, for example, I come from the Plains, and in our treaty with the government, um, we negotiated that we were to have this place in South Dakota called the Black Hills. And it's the most sacred place in the universe to my people. It's the center of our universe. And if it, you actually look at a satellite view of the Black Hills, it's shaped like a human heart. And we believe our origin stories, we came from a cave there. We would go there for ceremony every summer. It was the most sacred place in the world to us and to me. Um, and we were promised that, 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 that land in the treaty that we signed, um, the Fort Laramie Treaty, my, that's the uh, treaty my tribe signed with the U.S. government. But um, whenever, after, shortly after they signed the treaty, settlers found gold uh, in the Black Hills. And to this day, we were never given those land rights. And now it's a tourist trap. They, they mine gold and uranium in our Black Hills. And you got to be very wealthy to, to have a house there. And it's um, basically got turned into a tourist attraction. And uh, legally, this is all still illegal. But who's going to go beat the US government in their own court system and say, hey, this whole thing is illegal? You know? And so uh, whenever uh, we signed these treaties, they then marched us to death camps called reservations. So Indian reservations were usually one of two things in the United States. Um, a death camp where they marched us to die post-genocide or hard-fought ancestral lands that tribes like literally didn't back down from and stayed there and fought and fought and fought until it came to treaties. And then they're like, okay, this is our reservation. So, um, you know, tribes were relocated to, to different states, different areas, um, and, and, and res the reservation system was established. It was basically an open-air prison system, um, and we were not allowed to leave. Um, uh, the settlers dictated every aspect of our daily life, including when we got food, um, what houses we lived in, what we could do in our homes, when we could leave our homes. Um, it was basically an o reservation 
um, were open air prison systems in the beginning. And shortly after reservation systems in 1978, raise your hand if you were alive in 1978, cool. So when you were alive, the US government outlawed all Native American uh, religions under US law. Um, and basically the language they used, they outlawed our cultures. So they said our songs, our dances, our languages, um, our social ways of being, they called it our religion and they made it illegal under US law. And that law remained in place until, um, oh, oh, so it, it, it remained in place from 1884 until 1978. So for almost 100 years, that, that, that law was in place. So those of you that raised your hands, you know, you were alive when it was illegal for me to be Lakota and where the people who raised me had to um, be Lakota in secret. And, um, you know, where I'm from, they tell stories of how when they were kids, they would get arrested just for doing ceremony. Um, uh, and, and, and during this time, this is all tied into the historical trauma. There was also um, a, another government uh, policy about Indian boarding schools, and we may have heard of that before. So this was an actual U.S. policy um, that was started by a U.S. general. So this U.S. general named General Pratt came up with a solution to the Indian problem because the U.S. government was trying to exterminate us, and then they couldn't. And then they're like, we got an Indian problem. What are we going to do with, with these Indians? We need to assimilate them somehow. We need to make them American. And so uh, General Pratt came up with this idea of creating boarding schools for Indian children. And he went to the uh, US government, he lobbied, and, and they gave him funding, and they gave him a facility. And the first Indian boarding school was a military barracks in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And I've been there. And uh, it was US policy, and in the beginning, uh, I, I've read many accounts of how they, they uh, stole all of our children from our home communities through coercion, through force. A lot of the parents did not know what they were even signing their kids up for because the way our cultures existed, we didn't have schools where you just put the kids together and sent them off. I mean, the, every day we were together as a community learning and you know we didn't separate age groups. So a lot of our people didn't even know what they were sending their kids to and there was also a language barrier. And so you know the people out in the West doing this, they didn't care about a language barrier. They didn't care if these parents understood what was going on. We were the problem, we were the Indian problem. And they didn't perceive us as human beings. Um, so. They, 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 they stole a whole generation of children and took them to boarding schools where they were abused for speaking our language. Their hair was cut. Um, a lot of these children were sexually and physically abused. A lot of children died. The majority of children that went into these boarding schools died. Um, I have a good friend, she's Dene. She studied boarding schools for her dissertation. And she, she was telling me she read accounts where a lot of um, indigenous children in these schools actually starved themselves to death. So you can imagine what you gotta be doing to a child to make them starve themselves to death when you're feeding them three meals a day. So those that survived were my great grandparents' generation. And they carried a huge shame about being indigenous. And so not only was it illegal, you had a whole generation where it was abused into them that being native was dangerous and shameful. And so fast forward to today, you know, this, uh, this genocide, because it was systemically engineered, it's still happening. You know, um, we just had this, the Standing Rock issue about water rights, and that's a whole other issue. But we are still fighting for our right to live. They're still poisoning our water. They're still trying to take our lands because what, what, um, what kind of happened when they placed us on reservations is they put the Indians in the most desolate land where, where, where they thought no one could live, but these lands ended up being rich in minerals and resources. So now a lot of reservations are struggling um, with the U.S. government and corporations extracting resources from our land without consulting us and foregoing those treaties that I talked about, you know, further committing, um, committing crimes to, to commit this genocide. So I just want to... Um, bring it all and make it a little more real to us here in Chicago, the, the, this, this genocide, this historical trauma. So now I want to talk about another aspect of colonialism and genocide that leads to historical trauma, and it's a part of it, and it's erasure of the genocide, erasure of indigenous people. So when I moved to Chicago, I moved here in 2010, and I had never even been, been in a city this big. The, the, the place I come from is very rural. Um, in very country, I grew up on a ranch, and there's only one stoplight on our whole reservation. You know, we don't have no, no skyscrapers, nothing. And so I, it was a big culture shock for me to be here. 
And I was living in the UC downtown, a couple blocks south of here, my first year here. And the first week here, I had an experience that changed my life forever. And, and it plays into um, historical trauma. So I got in the elevator of my dorm, and this, this freshman girl got on the elevator with me, and it was just her and I. And she said, you have really pretty hair. What are you? And I was like, thank you. I'm, I'm Lakota. And she didn't know what Lakota meant, so I said, I'm Native American. And she looked at me confused, and she said, you guys are still alive? She thought we were extinct. College educated adult. You know, and that, that took me by surprise because in South Dakota, we deal with a lot of racism from non-Native people, from white people, especially the towns bordering the reservation because a lot of those people descended from the people that were killing my ancestors. And, um, but I never met someone that thought we didn't even know we existed. And then as I spent more time in the city, I started meeting more people that had that perception of us. And at the same time, I, had, I, was, I learned about this term called symbolic annihilation. And uh, it plays into this erasure. So I started asking people, where did you learn that, that we don't exist? You know, how did you come to that conclusion? And people would talk about reference movies. They would reference books. They would reference school and, and talk about how they never learned about us. And recently, a study was done where like 85% of US history books in this country don't mention indigenous people past the 1800s. And y'all are living on indigenous people's land where one of the biggest genocides in the world happened. So let, let's dig a little deeper. Not only did I meet a college educated adult who thought we were extinct that same semester, I had to take a US history course at Columbia College. And it was taught by this, um, this really nice guy he was a history buff. He was, a, he was an older dude, a white man. He was a lawyer, but he would come in and, and teach in the evenings. He just loved history, and he loved teaching. And so it was a, a, a U.S. Um, historical survey class. And so the first day of class, I walk in, and I see on the board, Crazy Horse, the Indian Wars, the Wounded Knee Massacre, things that happened where I'm from, and, I'm, and I already, my heart already drops to the floor because I know what experience is coming. And I'm sure if there's indigenous people in the crowd, they're going to share in this experience of being in a classroom and feeling this pressure. But basically, for the first two weeks, we learned about indigenous history. And every time he would say something, this professor would look at me to make sure he was right. And sometimes he wasn't right. And everyone would look at me. And meanwhile, I want to just bring perspective that I was paying to be in that classroom. And he was paying to teach that. But yet, I had to teach for him, and I'm not even educated in that field. I'm just a, I was just a kid from a reservation. You know, that is historical trauma in reality, and we're all a part of that. That is our erasure. You know, we all live on a, on a, on a, on a, on a land where one of the biggest genocides happened, and most of us aren't even aware of it. You know, but for the most part, that isn't our fault, but I'm, at this point, um, you know, I, 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 I think we can learn. And I'm glad that spaces like this now happen. I'm really grateful to, to be able to be here, you know. So I just want to kind of bring it all home. What is historical trauma? Well, for indigenous people, you know, it looks like language loss because of U.S. policy that made it illegal for us to speak our language for almost 100 years. And then they abused our great-grandparents. My great-grandmother took our language to the grave. She didn't teach it to anybody in our family. And I'm going to speak about that later. But that's something that... I, I deal with every day, a sadness that I deal with every day, loss of our land, loss of our culture, um, our erasure, and the shame that, that um, many generations carry about being indigenous. You know, it's funny now on the internet and because of things like DNA tests, being native is something cool, but where I come from and when I was younger, being native was something dangerous and people died because of it and people still die because of it. You know, so this historical trauma, um, is, is, is rooted for indigenous people, is rooted in our genocide, it's rooted in colonialism. And I think we all stand on that colonialism. We all sit in this settler colony that is a result of stolen land and stolen labor. And so, you know, I just see my place here as questioning what are we going to do about that now together? And I, um, I think we're going to talk about that here today, but um, that's just my perspective, my personal take on historical trauma. Thank you for bringing so much of that history here. Yeah, no, please, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate you grounding us in that history before we really get into the conversation. Britt, do you want to uh, share something about how you relate to this term and the work you've been doing? Yes, so um, 
So I uh, typically work as a journalist um, and an essayist and a critic. Um, so my work is really um, revolving around um, the intersections of race and gender um, in politics, usually through the lens of um, music and art and culture. Um, but for, you know, from a personal standpoint, I have been, um, you know, I was a, uh, Almost six years ago now, I was um, sexually assaulted on the train, and uh, the experience was very emotionally jarring for me. One of the first things that I did after it happened was that um, I uh, had like tweeted, I was assaulted. Um, I didn't know what else to do. I was just kind of in shock. Um, and immediately after that, I began sort of writing um, a series of essays that I began performing around the city as part of the city's um, live lit and storytelling community. Um, and I originally sort of entered that community just because I liked the idea of um, doing writing that was not, you know, writing about album reviews or writing about, you know, who was the producer on the new Drake album or something like that. Um, and it sort of turned into um, a really important healing space um, for me to kind of like process what I was going through and what the sort of repercussions were of that specifically. Um, and one of the things that, you know, became really kind of constant in terms of the work that I continued to pursue was not only the um, after effects of trauma and how it lingered and how it sort of, um, you know, uh, remained in the body, but was, you know, I was also sort of interested in the ways in which we kind of, um, expunge or expel that kind of trauma from our bodies and we find sort of liber uh, liberation um, through different forms of um, you know art and media and things like that. Um, so at present I am working on a um, book on a collection of essays about how trauma manifests in the body um, and it is uh, divided into three sections. So the first section is kind of about um, sort of the taking in of trauma. Um, and uh, one of the first um, sections, or one of the first, excuse me, chapters of um, the book is called The Cycle. It is specifically about um, sort of uh, generational trauma tied specifically to, um, you know, African-American women and our reproductive systems, our wombs. Um, you know, years after, um, you know, my assault, I began to get very, very sick. I was, um, you know, just to be completely frank, you know, I was vomiting all the time. I had really difficult periods. I was gaining lots of weight, all of these other sort of, you know, repercussions. And, um, you know, eventually I, after a lot of testing, you know, I, you know, learned that I had um, fibroids and ovarian cysts and endometriosis. I had a really traumatizing surgery that did not work that I had to pay for. Um, and, uh, you know, I was really interested in um, sort of the statistics behind that. So, um, you know, 80% of um, black women will get, um, you know, fibroids by the time that they are 40, um, which is astronomically higher than white women who, you know, on average will maybe 30 to 40% of them will get it by the time that they are 50. 50% um, of black women have endometriosis. And um, I was really kind of interested in, in looking at, you know, why there's kind of a lack of conversation around, um, you know, black female bodies and um, our reproductive systems and, um, you know, wondering and, and looking through sort of a lot of research as to whether or not um, there is something um, really key that we're not talking about, which is that we are passing down this trauma from, you know, woman to woman to woman. Um, and by passing down the trauma, I mean, you know, the trauma of how we came here, the trauma of, um, you know, how our bodies were used as, you know, just, you know, we were producing, you know, um, slaves, we had no autonomy, we were raped, we were, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, there was never really any resolution to that. Yes, yeah, slavery ended, but um, was, any sort of sense of humanity actually given to black women? No. And so um, those kinds of, uh, you know, inherited traumas can continue to manifest in really interesting ways, um, including uh, physically in the body, right? Um, and so um, that's kind of the sort of first part of uh, the book, um, thinking about that, thinking about sort of other forms of inherited trauma um, from, you know, I talk a lot about Chicago having grown up here um, and what it means to sort of exist in um, a city where people sort of push specific types of narratives about what it means to live in that city and does that actually sort of affect um, 
the behavior that happens in the city, right? You go someplace, and I, I just had a conversation recently. I was talking to a woman. I'm going to LA next week, and she was like, oh, where are you staying? I was like, oh, we're staying in so-and-so hotel in, in Hollywood. And, and she's like, oh, well, there's, you know, th that part, it's really funky. I was like, what the hell is, what does funky mean, right? And she's like, you know, she's like, well, it's, you know, it could, all sorts of things could happen. And I was like, I was like, well, I'm from Chicago. So um, I was like, in general, I know how to take care of myself. And she was like, oh, well, yeah, okay. You know, and I was kind of, it, you know, for me, I can like kind of joke about it because I'm from here, right? I'm from like, you know, um, uh, west side of the city. And, and, but it's also kind of like, you know, what are those, the perceptions that other people have, I was really kind of interested in. And so I've been um, kind of writing um, works um, and doing research related to that. Um, the second part of the book is sort of about um, kind of the um, recognition of trauma um, and um, sort of recognizing and understanding how it, it manifests in the body. So um, through those sort of um, physical um, reproductive issues, through those health problems, through those, you know, chronic illnesses, through um, things that, you know, we oftentimes don't have any sort of solution for, we don't have any sort of answers for, um, but we recognize that they happen to certain people more than others. And then and um, the third part, which I think is really rooted in a lot of the work that I do as a journalist, is um, about the ways in which, like I said, we sort of um, uh, expunge or expel that trauma from our bodies and, and really kind of looking at, um, you know, art and beauty and culture and these sort of um, uh, forms and means that people have, have had to create that um, black people in particular have created throughout time um, as a means of um, both ex you know, expressing as well as removing the trauma from their lives. Um, you know, looking at hip hop, at disco, at house music. Um, and so, um, yes, yeah, so that's kind of the, the work that I'm doing, thinking about um, sort of the um, ongoing sort of uh, inherited trauma that is, um, has been placed upon uh, black people in general and black women um, specifically and the ways in which we kind of, um, you know, address and um, hopefully like find joy and purpose despite or, or through that actual trauma. I wonder if anyone else has anything they'd like to share on this term historical trauma on what brought you to come here and have a discussion about this? Um, anyone have anything that you want to add to this before we dig in a little deeper? If I mentioned at the beginning and some of you have walked in in the process, uh, this is an open dialogue so you're very much a part of this so please do share your thoughts as well. Um, yay. Good evening. I'm interested because there is a lot of attention now, uh, once again, I'll say to the terminology diversity, equity, inclusion, or belonging, however you want to describe it, which is really based around historical trauma, structural racism, on and on. So I wanted to come here and kind of see what's happening um, outside of the world that I actually live in, and I'm a person that is leading some of the work um, or have been engaged in some of the work and conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and it's very difficult to bring the masses to the place where you guys are already because you're living it, you're part of it. Um, and so how do we um, continue the conversation, but what does it really mean to move the dial in these particular areas when you've got so much historical trauma that is present in people? Anyone have thoughts on that question? Moving that dial, we'll dig into a little bit more as well. I mean, I think we had talked about, do you wanna say something? Well, I was gonna say, um, I know for, kind of for myself, one of the ways in which I try to sort of um, address those issues, um, especially as they, as they relate to diversity and, and equity is, you know, understanding um, the platforms um, that I have and the outlets that I have and trying to, um, you know, share the stories and experiences that other people um, have gone through um, and sort of, you know, using my, you know, I, I think 
it's really interesting, um, as an aside right now, there's a lot of debate that's happening in the journalism world where um, people are saying, you know, journalists shouldn't vote, they should be very, you know, nonpartisan, they should be very this and that, and that's never how I approach journalism at all when I first started getting into it. For me, it was very much about, you know, trying to tell stories about, um, you know, people of color, about women, about, um, you know, black women in particular. Um, and so, you know, so I very much kind of enter into, um, entered into the, like the journalism world with maybe some, some bias, some purpose, um, and knowing that, you know, if I had the opportunity to, um, you know, write for certain places to talk about certain things that I was not going to just sort of do what everyone else was doing, but really kind of push forward um, uh, you know, certain ideas or, or certain voices, so there could be more of this, um, you know, inclusivity. So if we're talking about, you know, um, for example, you know, local Chicago music, that we're not just talking about, you know, who are the best garage rock bands, but we're talking about, you know, amazing young black, um, you know, um, singers and poets who um, are creating work that's talking about their experiences, you know, growing up on the south side of the city, um, that, you know, talking to, um, you know, people in the queer community who are creating different types of parties and events that are trying to, you know, be more inclusive, um, you know, outside of the north side, boys town, white male bubble, right? So um, that for me, you know, that to me has always been really um, important and, and key to the work that I do. And I think that for a lot of other people as well is, um, you know, it, it, the change should obviously happen on an institutional level, right? Like that is what is key. That's going to make the, the largest, um, you know, most effective change. But from an individual standpoint, for me, it has been very um, important to sort of go about doing things um, you know, on my own terms, even if it, it doesn't always, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm gonna be you know, very successful. And you both use a creative practice, it seems like, to address these issues, to get them into a wider, sort of more um, distributed uh, audience. Um, but also to call on those sort of joyful, pieces that have come out of this. And something we were talking about when we were having this discussion was uh, museums and how museums and media function to address these traumas, these uh, historical experiences and ongoing experiences, as you mentioned, Frank. Um, but I also wonder about re-triggering and that experience. I wonder if we could just talk a little bit about creative practices and about the places where they come into our lives and how we balance. So I could speak on that. And this also answers uh, the question you asked about how to get those gears turning towards the masses, you know, with this information. And, and uh, you know, for me, music and storytelling has always been, I think, the grease that gets those gears going. But I'm currently working at the Field Museum right now. So if, if um, any of you aren't aware, the Field Museum is, uh, has undertaken a huge multi-million dollar project to um, renovate and completely redo their native exhibition hall. And if you want to know what I felt about it, just uh, go on YouTube and type in Frank Juan Field Museum. When I was going to school at Columbia, um, someone asked me to do an interview. He, he, was, he had this uh, website where he would highlight artists, and for some reason we did a guerrilla style interview at the field, and he was just like, what do you think about this stuff? And I went in about symbolic annihilation, and I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, now that I'm working there, they had like s sacred items and things on display that shouldn't have even been up, you know? Like, I, I, I told them some of the stuff that, that I have handled from my people that was nailed to the wall would be equivalent if I took the hat off of the Pope and nailed it to the wall for 100 years, you know? Like, just, just the, the, the way that these museums handled human beings. You know, let's even think about that, that they, they have human beings in the, the, the Natural History Museum with the animals and the plants. That shows you how they viewed indigenous people. So, but, but these are the systems that we're working in. So after, you know, many years of their native exhibition hall being grossly colonial and, um, you know, contributing to a lot of colonialism, they decided to redo it. And they're working with indigenous people on, you know, almost every front. It's a, it's a big project. But... Um, my, 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 uh, my involvement in the project came through a visit I had in collections. So museums, I, I, 
uh, natural history museums only show about 98% of what they have, uh, or two percent of what they have. 98% of what they have is in collections. So. Um, Chicago is, was one of the first, and still is, one of the big stop-offs um, coming from the plains, coming from the west. So what happened was a lot of these like fur trappers and kind of like these rugged guys that would go out and collect things, um, you know, as this land was being colonized, would also collect our artifacts, our ceremony objects. They would kill us and take things and come and sell it to museums, you know. So um, that's how they collected a lot of things from the plains. They actually have the largest collection of plains war shields in the world. They have Sitting Bull's war shield there. They, you know, they have really sacred, powerful objects here in this city. And so I, I got to visit collect and I seen they have a lot of um, flutes, native flutes, ancestral flutes from my people. And um, I just always felt those instruments calling out to me to make music to them and just think about the last time a Lakota person has even been near those objects. You know, it's probably been, been a long, long time because um, they just now started, started letting native people visit collections. And so um, I'm going to be co-curating a, 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 a room in the new Native Exhibition Hall, um, sampling some of my ancestral flutes they have in collections to, you know, highlight some of the things we talked about, like why do they have these, talk about, you know, how our cultures were illegal, why reclaiming these things is important, but also because I'm a producer and, you know, I love making music and I love collaborating, I'm going to create a space where people can come in and create music with those flutes and, and, and the sounds that we sample. So, you know, bringing, bringing our, our tools, our art, back to its original concept, which was to, you know, human interaction and, and to, to educate and to carry on our stories. We never really made anything to be on display, you know, and, and so I'm, um, th that's a little bit of the work I'm doing at the field, trying to push back against, you know, um, uh, Museums are, are, are a staple, are, are a, one of the founding pillars of colonialism, you know, extracting. Um, and a colonialism is about extracting with no reciprocity, whereas indigenous cultures, cultures are about reciprocity. We may extract, but we only take what we need and we give back. But these museums just took, 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 took. And now we're working with them and they're working with our communities and a whole lot of indigenous people to try to establish a relationship with our communities and the communities who um, have ancestral rights to the objects that they have and, and figuring out how we move forward, you know. And also, j just on that tip too, as a performer, um, museums account for about a third of my work. And so historically, museums were one of the few places you can see indigenous people. And look at today, these are still one of the few places you can see and interact with indigenous people. So I think you know, we could use that to our advantage, museums. And I think the field's taking steps towards that, and this dialogue for me is, is taking steps towards that of recognizing that, hey, we've always had Indians in our museums. Let's keep inviting Indians in, and let's let them tell the stories now instead of trying to, trying to, trying to tell the stories for them. So, um, you know, that, that, that's just a, a bit of my, my work at, at the field and with museums on that front. Does anyone else have a, a moment that they want to share, any depictions or representations that you've encountered that either felt restorative or felt problematic? That's a good question. Based on what you just, I have a question. I wonder, um, in conversations of repatriation of um, indigenous, like, uh, quote unquote, artifacts, right? Um, if the, you're having conversations about the toxins used to preserve those artifacts and the fact that it, you know, yeah, arsenic yeah. being a huge one of them. Yeah, I mean, well, um, these so this project's been about a year and a half in, in, in the works with the actual curating of the hall. But before that, they had, um, they have a native advisory board full of um, awesome indigenous scholars, artists, um, museum people from around the world. Um, and, you know, I've met with these people. So they, they've, th that's a big part of the project and the conversation is uh, if objects can be returned, which ones can, which ones can't. But just on that tip, um, so there will be five kind of rooms or spaces within the hall. The larger hall will have a theme, but then um, what I'm doing is just an example of one of the rooms, and, and they will also rotate out. So, so they will be continually working with indigenous people to work with items and collections to retell our story. So um, my exhibition won't be up for 100 years. You know, it, It'll be up for so many years, and another person will be able to tell their story. But one of the rooms involves uh, um, the uh, 
repatriating some seeds, some heirloom seeds they have in collections that belong to the Meskwaki tribe out in Tema, Iowa. And um, they're going to tell the story of how they're returning those and trying to replant them back home and just um, what happens with that. So, so it's, a, it's a big conversation that, that, that's a big part of that project. And, um, but a lot of the objects are, um, have, have toxins on them. And, 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 and you know, it, it would be, it would be a, a, big, a, a big task for the museum. So they've just barely started. Hi, I was so moved by what you just said about museums and extraction without compensation. And then also you mentioned triggering. So I care about what that must feel like to go to the Field Museum. And they better be compensating you incredibly well. Yeah. And, and, uh, as, and I hope you're being compensated for tonight. Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely. I, Great. I don't leave my apartment anymore unless I'm being compensated, to be honest. <laughs> But 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 yeah no no um that uh, that's a big part of the conversation is figuring out what that reciprocity looks like in action and and it's a labor of love I'm not gonna sit here and pat them on the back because they got a lot of work to do but you know they've come a long ways but they got a long ways to go you know any other moments of representation folks want to share anyone back here oh David's coming to you. I have a question, mostly for everyone. I, since we were talking about museums, um, one question that I have in mind right now is this idea of, and please, if you have experience with this, let me know, because one conversation that we're having in my institution is um, the idea of land acknowledgments and how to, you know, is it, do we do it? And if we do it, is it just like lip service or what else can we do if we do decide to do that kind of thing? Um, so I'm really curious to know what other everybody here in the audience might think or maybe best practices as far as like how to go about that because I've been to different conferences or institutions where they do um, approach that sort of like um, land acknowledgement um, every time there is a big event, uh, every time there's like a big sort of opening doors for big audiences to come in. So I'm really curious to know sort of like that, how do you approach that idea of like land acknowledgements? Well, uh, I, I could just kind of start because I, I, get, I get asked to do um, several of those here in the city. Now, I've done some here at the museum for award ceremonies, but I, I talk about this when I do these land acknowledgments because um, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar, I'll just real quickly, land acknowledgments are at the beginning of beginning of an event or social gathering, just the institution, you know, the organization kind of just acknowledging the indigenous tribes whose land um, they sit on. And it has become a popular practice up in Canada. It really took off, and it's just kind of starting to take off down here. But, you know, kind of what you spoke on, um, it can just become like a placeholder, like a lip service, like a Band-Aid, you know. It's like, oh, it's colonialism and genocide, land acknowledgement. It's all right now. But, you know, but uh, for me, you know, I think about um, what... When I, when I do land acknowledgments, I talk about what decolonization really means. And what that really means is giving land back to indigenous people. So, like, if we're working towards that, cool, but, like, let's all make sure that that's the end goal. And, and for me, maybe, like, just off of the top of the head, and, and these are conversations, you know, that we're having in um, different projects I'm doing, but... If you're going to acknowledge land, I also want to see like more action, like include indigenous people in in the programming. You know, like have indigenous an indigenous person speak, cater from an indigenous company. You know, like what's that reciprocity look like? Like acknowledging the land is one step, but but like providing, I think in in, in all of us, you know, in these institutions, sit in positions of privilege, especially on indigenous communities. So we could always provide opportunities for indigenous people, you know, and just get creative about that. And I know that it can be done, but, you know, that's our task. And like I was saying, I think museums present a unique space in this country where we can shift that narrative for indigenous people if, we're, if we do it with the right intention and, and, get, and get the right people, you know, involved. Because museums are spaces and places where indigenous people have already been seen and represented. Um, grossly and, and misrepresented, but now, you know, the, the, we, we can still um, hold space in these places, and what does that look like? Britt, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about representation and how that feels for you, those examples perhaps of representation that feels fulfilling or, as you were saying, healing, 
um, versus the kinds of representation that you might see that feels, I don't know, hollow or, or maybe re-triggering? There's anything that you have to say on that? Um, I think in general that um, when you're talking about representation, it's more than just having, um, you know, a, a body on the screen or one person in the room or, um, you know, even someone just sort of writing about something that was, you know, created by... Um, you know, a marginalized or disenfranchised population. For me, um, what I find to be more valuable is um, representation that um, is maybe kind of placed or rooted in a position of um, power, representation that is kind of, you know, if you're thinking about um, film, for example, um, it's not just having like a black character in a movie, it's having a black writer, a black director, um, you know, uh, the black production, you know what I mean? Like, um, that to me f feels more um, relevant and more um, of uh, an actual statement than just sort of having a, a one person um, in the room. Oftentimes when, you know, when you are that one person in the room, um, you both don't have the opportunity to sort of accurately um, represent uh, for your community in the way that you would like to. Um, but also, you know, um, people just sort of have you there to feel better about themselves. And that's why it feels so hollow because you sort of realize that you are not necessarily a person um, that is part of, um, you know, what is actually happening in that room. You are just a symbol for other people to feel better about themselves. Um, and I know from personal experience that has always been um, really tricky for me because I um, have had to, you know, I am often the only black person in the room, certainly <laughs> most often like the, the only black woman in the room. Um, and, you know, you sort of realize, oh, my purpose here is to have other people feel like they can pat themselves on the back instead of actually being, um, you know, heard and seen and acknowledged. Um, and so, you know, what I have actively sort of tried to do in terms of that representation is bring more people into that room. Um, one, just for safety reasons, because oftentimes too, when you are that person um, in the room, I'm thinking about kind of when you were talking about in your classroom, I remember when I was in high school and I was in an AP US history class, right? And my teacher kind of turned, it was like slavery. And it was like literally the whole class like turned to me, right? And I was the only black girl in that class. And it's like, okay, this is not a safe environment. And I think I was, that was one of the first times that I had sort of actively experienced that, sort of feeling like this does not feel safe to me. I do not want to be here. I remember talking to my mother about it. I had a lot of issues of teachers <laughs> throughout kind of high school because of situations like that where it was sort of feeling like, yeah, I'm here, but I'm also sort of, you know, being scapegoated or being sort of thrown aside or being, you know, whatever. So um, for me, I think, you know, representation has to kind of come at all angles, right? It can't just be, if we're talking about a museum, it, you know, it can't just be a, uh, an exhibition of like someone cool, right? It, you know, um, it can't be like an exhibition of just like Virgil Abloh. It would have to be, you know, who are the curators, you know, who are the assistants, who are the people who are working, um, you know, throughout? What are the events that are happening like off site that um, are, are speaking to those communities, but also um, thinking about two, um, you know, why are certain people sort of chosen to be that representation and others are not? Um, you know, I think this is a discussion that happens a lot of times in um, like the, I know at least in like sort of like my circles, right? And we will sort of be like, why was, why was she chosen to be like the person in the room? And it's like, oh, maybe because that person um, is able to, you know, uh, shut up when they need them to shut up and to not fight back and to not argue and to, you know, and, and that's not me. Certainly never has been. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm, I'm usually the one who's getting in trouble. And so, um, you know, it, it makes you wonder. So I'm, I'm always, you know, so I'm also kind of, for me, um, 
I, I want representation to be more than just a face, and I want it to be more than just one person. I want it to be um, all-encompassing. I want it to be complex. I want it to truly be diverse. Um, and, you know, it, um, and I want it to um, really consider why certain people are allowed in certain spaces um, and certain people are not allowed in those spaces. Um, yeah, I had a question, um, or, or yeah, just kind of requesting for you guys to expound a little bit more about how creative expression, when it's used as a means of working through trauma, becomes kind of a commodity, and how um, I studied like ethnomusicology in undergrad, and just thinking about how you create something, and it maybe has a purpose um, for you personally, but then it kind of goes out into the world and, and becomes another thing, and, and people start to connect with it in other ways. And, and I guess just wondering about some of the, maybe the findings that you have. Like I'm thinking, for instance, when um, the rapper No Name recently said that she wasn't going to perform for white audiences anymore. And just kind of what does that look like when a creative work becomes kind of a commodity out in the world and it's used to work through trauma, but also takes on other meanings for other people. And yeah, I guess just like when a work is separated from its context. Uh, I'll just speak from an indigenous perspective, and um, luckily, you know, and, and it, it's funny you mentioned no name. I was aware of that, and it just made me think of myself as an artist. And the thought I had was, "Well, I'm glad like most of my audience isn't white people. Like most of my audience is natives, because uh, you know, like that genocide and erasure plays into even my opportunities. So for the most part." Um, my people book me and take care of me. And I'm just starting to see opportunities outside of what we call Indian country and starting to deal with that very thing where our trauma becomes a commodity, you know, whereas um, those uh, groups of other communities of people in this country, their trauma have been on display since forever, you know. And so I'm coming from a place of our, our trauma and our genocide kind of being in the hiding. But I think for me as an artist, I'm aware of that now. And, and I had to learn the hard way of, you know, like she was saying, being used just to make other people in privilege feel better. And, you know, just times I got burned where I realized I had to safeguard myself as an artist and I think just as a human. So, you know, I, I do that now where, you know, I, if it's going to be out there in the world, it's because I, I really only want that to be out. And there are more personal things that I'm, I'm going to share one later of my work, stuff maybe I only do live because it's only meant for like, you know, these sorts of spaces and maybe something I ain't going to record and put out because it might be consumed or ripped apart in that sort of way, you know. So, so that was just my perspective on it. Um, yeah, I think it is, um, I think it's an issue that is uh, continuously ongoing that um, unfortunately I don't necessarily see um, an end in sight to it happening. Um, I think, you know, coming from a sort of um, music journalist perspective, you know, we can, at least in the black community, can kind of trace it back to blues you know, and then blues being taken, and then jazz, and then jazz being taken, and then rock and roll, and then rock and roll being taken, and then, you know, um, I have a, I wrote an essay called The Disco Essay, um, and uh, it's about my experiences of um, uh, why I love disco as a genre, um, and how it was sort of born as a genre um, created by the black and Latino communities and, um, you know, black and Latino queer communities in particular and, you know, dance as a form of um, release and expression and things like that. And then it's sort of being taken and you get like kind of, you know, you get like Rod Stewart making a disco song. Do you know what I mean? So it's, um, <laughs> so, you know, um, but, but like disco, house music, rap, it's just continuously happening. Um, and, you know, I think that um, as long as we live in a sort of hyper-capitalist society, um, which is what the United States very much is, um, that it's going to continue to happen. I feel like um, for creators, though, it is important to figure out the ways in which to, you know, you can protect yourself, um, keep yourself safe, because, um, you know, you, 
putting anything out in the world can invite people to sort of um, create their own interpretations of that work, um, create, you know, create, uh, you know, audiences that you did not expect for that work as well. Um, but, you know, these people who are absorbing um, the art that you have created out of your trauma, um, they're not necessarily, you know, giving anything back to you. So you have to do, um, you know, a lot of work to really sort of, you um, protect yourself and and I've you know you've kind of seen it sort of manifest in a number of different ways so I think of um, if I think of something like house music right um, you know Chicago house music and you know even through the numerous waves it is very distinct um, and I think that you know that is because in large part you know even though Chicago house artists will maybe travel around the world and things like that they have done a lot of work to kind of keep it rooted in um, the city right and so they're like okay you want to hear all these like artists you're gonna have to come to Chicago you know for the chosen few picnic and that's what it has to be like you know maybe we'll come to Berlin or something once a year but if you really want to experience this then you got to come to to where we are where we feel safe in our community, what we've been doing for the last like 25 years compared to, um, you know, so it, it's like like things like that, you know, kind of keeping it, um, um, I don't want to say like insulated or sort of isolated, but keeping it so its roots are still um, there. Um, because otherwise, you know, what you get is um, what happened in the, you know, middle of the last decade where you get really um, crappy EDM and people are like, where did this come from? And oh, it's all these like bros creating these songs in their dorm room. And it's like, hold up, wait a minute. Let's go back to like the roots of this. Why was this actually created? What was the purpose of this? It's like, oh, this music was created in Chicago and Detroit. It was a reaction to, you know, the disco demolition that happened in Chicago. That's not a coincidence in my mind, you know, um, that was, you know, specifically targeted towards this music that was created by black and Latino people as a means of expression. And so it's, you know, we, we so it's, so when I, I think about like things like that, I think about, um, you know, sometimes you do have to be like a no name and the only way you can kind of like express those frustrations is to just be completely honest about it. And yeah, it might've turned off some of her audience, but she is, you know, first and foremost, she was a poet, right? And so, so much of her work was sort of rooted in these kind of personal experiences. And maybe you, need, you do need to kind of like, you know, the only way you can kind of control that that audience is is being you know protective of yourself and whatever means that you have to be protective of yourself. Um, I have a, a little bit of an anecdote I want to share with the room because I also want to think about ways in which people of color can also do work that can leave lasting impacts on institutions. And the anecdote I want to share is an art performance, a durational art performance that happened over several days, perhaps weeks, by an artist duo uh, by the names of Coco Fusco and Guillermo Gomez Peña. And that happened at the Field Museum in the 90s, and the story was coming to me as you're talking about your experiences there. Um, they were, at that time, creative and life partners, and they were invited to the Field Museum to do a kind of contemporary disruption. And oftentimes you find historic museums asking to contemporary artists, especially contemporary artists of color, to make these sort of interventions and bring institutions up to the moment. And so they put on a performance with the understanding and uh, complicity of the curatorial department uh, called Two Undiscovered Amerindians. And they did that performance knowing that this institution both uh, located where it is uh, in the States could somehow have to face at some point all the annihilation and erasure and genocide that had happened on these lands and it happened to indigenous people but they did it as a farce and a parody. So they dressed up as Amerindians, pretended to be from the Mesoamerica let's say. Um, I swear she was wearing like a feather skirt and coconut boobs, but also like a headdress and sunglasses. He was in something very similar. But again, intentionally, this was not as disrespect, but knowing that the audience would be relatively ignorant. And they were literally in a cage. The nickname of the, of the performance is called Couple in a Cage. That's what has been known as historically. And the furor 
that this brought up for this institution was amazing. Now, again, it was meant to be a parody to say, the only reason this performance could happen is because everyone thinks all Native people are dead. Everyone thinks all Native people have never seen electricity. Right, they put a TV in there and like basically bounced around like all shocked <laughs> at the magic coming from the box. But they were sort of making a commentary not only of the ignorance of the audiences, but also the way in which bodies had been desecrated inside museums. And that performance tore that museum apart. People resigned from the board. There were letter writing campaigns. And there's no real moral to the story for me, except for to say that there are moments when people in their creative practices can literally leave traumas on institutions, a kind of necessary trauma. Because I think the first step into thinking about how we uh, move the needle, and I'm sorry, the sister who asked that question uh, left, is to get those institutions to First, admit to their own ignorance, and then admit to the trauma they've been inflicting. Anyone else like to add? Sorry, it's from like four questions back. Um, but I guess relating overall, um, and Rather than make you guys do all the labor, I guess this would be more a question to like people that work in museums. Um, like Frank, and I'm sure a lot of indigenous artists, a lot of my income is museum-based or um, institution-based, you know, different schools and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if this is true for most grants, but the majority of my funding, I literally have to answer a paragraph that says, that ask me what my traumas are and how I overcame that and like how I'm presenting this work to them and how that's framed um, within that time frame. So I quite literally for a living like have to be triggered and know the response for that articulately to be paid for it. And I was just sort of wondering like is that necessary? And like can't I just make fucking work about like what I'm doing right then at the time? Like it's not always about I mean, I do, I do get funding from a lot of science things. So I work with epigenetic research and I do talk about things on like an artistic, I work in like STEM in general. So I do, I do a lot of like science and art crossovers. So it is important to talk about, but like, I don't know how, like why it's become so mandatory really. Like I don't think it should have to be mandatory. I don't know if there's like museum people that could comment on that. Who would like to share about that? I can share something, but I'd rather you all speak. So if anyone else wants to talk, I'll give you priority. I can share my thinking, though. Just raise your hand if you want to help with this. <laughs> I, I mean, my thought is just this is, this is an issue in museums. So as someone who works in a museum and has studied art history, it, it is an issue. I think since, I don't know, Naomi helped me, like the 60s, 70s, identity politics in museums, institutional critique, this idea that if you are a non-white artist, you need to be making art that looks a certain way it, because you need to be representing that identity that you're bringing into the museum, that you should be making art that looks like black art or native art or whatever. And I, I think we're in a moment where that is rising to the top again, where there is this conception of what that type of art looks like. And we are concerned about inclusion. But in that concern about inclusion, one of my worries as someone who works in a museum is that we only consider it inclusion if it looks like this stereotype of that kind of art. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I don't know if to save up. <laughs> I think we all heard that. <laughs> we are recording this, so that's why I'm just sort of forcing everyone. But that question of trauma porn, I think, is is very important. I have a few experiences being in art school and having to deal with trauma porn and being native in a very colonial institution, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm in the designed objects department, um, but. I just signed up for an abstract expressionism studio. So I paint for hours. And my professor, he kind of had this idea of how I should be painting like a native. And I was like, 
how does a native paint? And then he was like, um, and I was like, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I painted myself as a response to, why don't you paint like a native? I'm like, okay, I'm gonna paint myself then, because I'm like a native, because I am a native. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I found that to be extremely frustrating, because even like if I'm doodling, he'll be like, oh, is that something from home? And I'm like, no, I'm just thinking about flowers. Like, leave me be. <laughs> or like, um, what was the pre trauma porn? Oh, huh, I took a Native American art history class. And I was one of, well, it was me and then somebody else who is indigenous to South America. But we didn't even really talk about South America. And I thought that was weird because it was in Native arts of the Americas. But we only talked about really North America. And I got very frustrated because the professor often looked to me for guidance. And I was like, um, oh, that too, yeah. The um, professor is white. <laughs> yeah, she she's very white. <laughs> they always are. <laughs> yeah, um, we actually all came here from school. Yeah, um, she's she always used like I studied indigenous studies, so I know things. And I'm like, but do you though? Do you really? She studied like southwestern pottery, so she thinks she's like an expert now. So, <laughs> um, yeah. She very much glazes over history, even though we spend an entire semester talking about Native art. And like the intro to the class is extremely frustrating. And it was very emotionally draining and triggering for me, because she kind of dove into the Dakota 38 and was like, hey, this is Native history, genocide, murder, bloodbaths. And I'm like, OK, but you could have gave me like a trigger warning or maybe some mental preparation or maybe like an alternative to this. But she totally like wrecked me for a good few weeks and I was like maybe you shouldn't do that and then she was like well how am I gonna tell all of the stories if I can't tell the truth and I'm like there's a different way you can tell truths and you don't have to make me traumatized to do it <laughs> yeah well thank you for sharing those experiences as you see it's still happening you know I, I I was dealing with that a decade ago and they're still dealing with that in classrooms in this city at art schools but I want to speak on what you're saying about the way you paint not being native enough. So I performed at the National Museum at Duke University in November. They um, hosted this amazing uh, traveling exhibit that started in the Southwest called uh, New Voices, New Visions. It's a, a contemporary indigenous uh, exhibit. And um, one of the paintings in there is by uh, this legend, Oscar Howe. He's, he's like one of, he's one of our legends. And it's an amazing painting, and, and, and they go in. It's the first painting you see in the whole exhibit, and it talks about what she's dealing with. This man is a literal legend. His works are, are now world-renowned, but during his prime, he would submit to art shows, and they told him his paintings weren't native enough. And it's literal paintings of indigenous people, but they told him his paintings weren't native enough. And like back in the 60s, or I think 50s, he wrote a manifesto about that very thing, about, well, what is indigenous art? And I'm an indigenous person, so what I make is indigenous art. So, you know, I just want to highlight that, you know, our forefathers dealt with that, and, and, and our young artists, we're still dealing with that, you know? But... I think um, this conversation can get us thinking about ways we can hopefully shift that and, and, and change that perspective and narrative. Hi. Um, so I was just thinking, because we're talking a lot about um, inherited trauma, and I had to think about the flip side of that coin and what inherited conquerization is as well. Because, I mean, maybe, and I'm just reading what I've wrote here, um, how can I include you if I cannot conquer what you are? And so, I don't know, maybe we're coming too much from that space rather than just actual inclusion, inclusion and diversity. So I came this evening, I'm not an artist or an art student, but um, spent 20 years in corporate HR and focused on diversity, inclusion, and equity for much of that time. And I'm currently studying to be a mental health therapist because of the amount of mental trauma 
that we as humans are carrying around. And I came tonight because it's part of what I'm studying, but I've been gifted with the opportunity to study what I'm passionate about. And that's um, the ability to explore curiosities and connect with people as, um, you know, to, to hold people's narratives with respect and trust and to seek information and, and ask what your story is and what can I do with your story to uplift it or just hold it with respect. Um, and I acknowledge it. I'm in a class right now where um, it's very challenging. We're having those tough discussions. So I'm a white woman, in case you didn't see. Um, and we're having those tough conversations about the ability for um, white people, women or men, to be able to help people of color, to be able to help heal the traumas and understand that these inherited traumas, you mentioned earlier, um, they impact your body. People carry this in your bodies. I mean, there's so much work out here around the physical impacts and the, the mental impacts. And, you know, the question that we're talking about in these classes is how do we help people move forward um, in a respectful and healthy way? And, and what are the right conversations and the right outlets to do that in? And so, I mean, I, I appreciate everybody's vulnerability tonight and being able to just have these open conversations and um, without judging and hopefully create some mindsets that will shift a little bit as we walk out of here. I'm really extroverted, but tonight I feel shy, but my name's Kendall. I live in Chicago. Uh, I'm an international trauma activist and a painter. I graduated from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. I am a, a trauma um, activist, and I interview people that have had traumatic experiences. Um, a podcaster. I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse and child sex trafficking. So um, I do a lot of um, independent research on sexual trauma and how it kind of um, executes itself in kind of diseases and, and stuff like that and, and narrative that goes through our lives. And um, I did an artist residency in the Amazon jungle uh, maybe like five years ago and just getting back to what you're talking about. Just um, it was interesting going down there because um, like looking at the collections we have in museums and like going into those indigenous tribes and like really how do we document um, that, that narrative and that history and like how do you respectfully like take artifacts and, and display them without actually like taking and removing from? And I just feel like, yeah, I just, I'm just here tonight because I'm a, a trauma activist, I'm an artist. And it was actually kind of interesting just sitting here thinking about how my art is received. I'm primarily a painter this year. I worked in audio, but somebody had come up to me a couple of weeks ago and said, you know, Kendall, people are going to receive your work or you as an artist this way because you are white and blonde. And I was like, gosh, you know, that's so interesting because I think we really need to like remove those things and just really come to receive people's narrative and then make that assessment. I think I really respect both of your work because I think art is a catalyst for change. And I think the, the paintings that I make are really playful and bright and kind of dark in their narrative. And I think like what you were talking about is you write about music and you write about kind of pop culture and what's going on. But I think that really opens the door to have the conversations we need to have. And I think that's really sociable, socially responsible. And I just really appreciate the work that you're doing and the work that you're doing trying to preserve um, that narrative. So, yeah. We are coming to um, the time that we said we would keep you here. And I want to be mindful of the time that you've spent with us. Um, are there any last thoughts that you both have to kind of close us out um, of this conversation? Yeah. Um, I think we um, uh, unfortunately didn't get enough time to talk about this, but um, I am a firm believer in um, the um, power of... Um, the power of uh, the creation of art as a means to sort of um, address um, the ways in which trauma um, 
kind of manifests in the body. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we can um, kind of continue to do going forward is to obviously, um, you know, consuming, um, you know, different art forms that were sort of um, built upon the experiences of people who went through numerous types of um, trauma, but also to really kind of um, sit with the history of it. Um, something that it kind of, um, I, the reason why I say that is because I kind of, um, I find it really interesting to kind of like uh, observe the TikTok phenomenon as a 32-year-old woman and how like, like, rap is so popular on it, but it's like people aren't necessarily really listening to what is being said. It's just sort of a means of getting likes and hits and, you know, getting more views and getting more followers. And um, I think that right now there's something really, um, I don't want to say dangerous, but something that's really um, scary to observe that people are no longer sort of... Um, uh, necessarily kind of engaging in um, the uh, art and culture that was created as a means of um, healing for people um, outside of um, it just sort of being a placeholder to have fun um, or to kind of, you know, get views and things like that or to sort of build um, someone's social capital. And so, um, you know, I'm just kind of interested in, in um, you know, what can we do um, as people to sort of um, both enjoy as well as sort of, you know, respect the roots of um, the art that's being created by, um, you know, different people because, you know, otherwise it's it sort of, it's almost kind of like a re-traumatization again. Um, sometimes I feel that when I see people kind of just, you know, like uh, taking in something, but not necessarily acknowledging um, why it was created in the first place um, or just sort of using it as something, um, you know, that can then just as quickly be discarded as well. So um, I don't know, just something, some a thought to kind of, um, leave people with so uh, I would like to finish with a song you all want to hear some music to close it out kind of kind of uh, kind of uh, bring it home in a, in a, in a positive way so um, this song I'm going to do I think is, is is a good example of a lot of things we talked about and kind of w w another thing I do as a, an indigenous artist so you know I'm a hip-hop artist I'm a producer I play several instruments, but what I'm about to show you is kind of distilling my practice down to, I think, its core elements. So I'm going to do a song for you all that I wrote on flute, and uh, this is a thank you song. So uh, a lot of indigenous nations, tribes, um, different cultures have, have thank you songs. You know, um, we, we gave thanks every day, and Lakota people, we have a song for everything. You know, we had like birth songs, death songs, thank you songs, ceremony songs. We had probably had a song for writing a song. You know, like we sang songs for it before we did everything. And so, um, you know, just kind of thinking about that and thinking about how my ancestors approached songwriting. And, and a lot of times our songs were literal prayers, you know, just prayers and asking help from the universe. And so I try to, you know, approach my songwriting in that way and a lot. And so this song is um, a song where I needed to get English out of the way. So we were all sitting here um, talking about, you know, th this topic in my colonizer's language. Um, we, we are using the colonial language here in this country. And a lot of indigenous languages suffer genocide, including my own, and are in a point of trying to revitalize those languages. And so my great-grandmother took our language to the grave, and I didn't know until I was in my early 20s that she was fluent in our language. And my mom said she would only speak Lakota around other grandmothers. They would have a, a community flea market every weekend. And when the grandmas would get together, they would speak Lakota to each other, but they wouldn't speak it at home. And I used to never think about why, because you know, growing up, um, a lot of times I didn't get a question my reality, because me and my mom, she was a single mom, we were stuck in survival a lot. You know? And I think a lot of people who carry historical trauma are stuck in a, a state of constant survival. We don't even have time to stop and think about these things. You know? and, and so I, I didn't even get a you know, question, why did, she, why did Grandma Lulu take our language to the grave? And then I learned about boarding schools, and I realized that she had went to a boarding school. And I realized that she, you know, those things are never really talked about yet in my home communities. Even the, our, our grandparents that, that suffered from that, a lot of them took it to the grave. 
And my grandmother did not teach Lakota to our family to protect them and keep them safe because she was abused for speaking our language. And I didn't know that until I was in my 20s. And I felt, you know, imagine I felt like I realized there was a hole in my heart my whole life. Something was ripped out and I didn't even realize that whole time. And that's where a lot of pain and different things were coming from. That's historical trauma. You know, so I decided to use my, my songwriting to relearn my language. And, you know, I have songs now where I'm rapping in Lakota and stuff, but what I'm about to do is another method I use to help me learn and express and heal. So I wanted to write a thank you song, but I wanted to write a thank you song for someone who saved my life. This is a song I wrote for um, a medicine man back where I'm from, uh, a spiritual leader. He passed away about a year and a half ago, and he was like a grandfather to me. He was a very old Lakota man, and um, he... he he uh, was a medicine person for a lot of people on my home reservation. And um, a lot of people got a lot of help and healing from him. And the things that he did to help us and save us were illegal until 1978, you know. So he had to do, had to do these things in secret to keep them alive so someone like me could go there and pray and, get, and have my life saved because I went to him at a point when I was very suicidal. And that's another point of our historical trauma is Native youth are 10 times more likely to commit suicide than the national average. And that isn't just for some any um, abstract reason. It's rooted in our genocide. It's rooted in the fact that we live in a country where from the ground up they made it hard to be a Native. And I know a lot of Native people every day we wake up, it's hard to be Native in this country. And that was systemically engineered for hundreds of years. And, um, you know, luckily we, we now can get in touch with our ceremonies and our languages and our songs and our dances and the things that they took from us and made illegal. And so this man saved my life when I was 19 years old and um, gave me my Lakota name. My Lakota name is Oyate Trecha Omani, which means walks with the young nation or walks with the new nation. And they gave that to me because of what I'm doing as an artist. And they gave that to me before I even started becoming successful as an artist. It was like foreshadowing. And I was taught that that name is what belongs to my spirit. You know, Frank Juan, what is that? That's English. And so that man passed away, and he treated me better than a lot of my own blood family. And uh, this world is a lot darker without him. And I, and I realized that the only way I could really say thank you is to use my gift to do stuff like this and use my gift to its fullest potential. And I could never say thank you enough in English. It just wouldn't do it. And so I put it into this song and I wrote, I took our word for thank you, which is wopila. And for, for males is wopila yellow is how we express it is the masculine way. And so um, another thing that I naturally started doing as I was playing flute was I would listen to the birds. I live in the south side and the birds would gather in my alley and I'd listen to the birds for inspiration. And I recently learned in my research at the field that that's how my ancestors used to write songs before colonialism is we would, we would listen to the birds. And so um, this medicine man, he had an ego author, so I was thinking about that and I, I, I mimicked the ego call in the way that I play this song. And literally put the syllables, wopila yellow, like I'm speaking it through the flute. And so, you know, kind of distilling my practice down to its core, this is one way I carry the past, the present, and the future with me as an artist and try to create tools that will help me heal because I found that when I did that and put them out into the world, they helped other people heal too because I wasn't alone. You know, I think that's one thing we're seeing here in this room, we're not alone. And so I'll leave us with this song. This is a thank you song. But this is a thank you to you all, too, for being here and just taking the time and space to, to be here and learn. Because you could have been anywhere, but, you know, I think we all learned something here tonight. I know I did. So this is uh, Wopila Yellow. Check, check, one, two. This is for a medicine man named Roy Stone Sr., Sichungu Lakota Medicine Man.
Thank you. What a beautiful way to um, end this evening. I want to thank all of you for sharing this space with us tonight, for being here, for bringing your thinking. Um, it's just inspiring to, to see all of you and to hear from you. Um, and most especially, thank you, Frank and, and Britt, for being here and for sharing so much with us tonight. It was truly appreciated. <laughs>